Hi, everyone. Welcome to Playbook, Time, Absence, and Desire, an intimate conversation with authors Maria Much and Patty M. Hall. And we'll be discussing Maria's brand new novel, Molly Falls to Earth. I'm Tali Baran, the founder and publisher at the Soapbox Press, and I'm so honored to be your host for this evening. I'd like to take a moment to acknowledge that although we're gathering in a virtual space, the Soapbox Press rests on the traditional territory of many nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabeg, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat peoples, and is now home to many diverse First Nations, Inuit, and Métis peoples. Apologies if I pause. Um, I'm just letting people in so they can also join tonight's festivities as they enter. We also acknowledge that Toronto is covered by Treaty 13 with the Mississaugas of the Credit. As we're all connecting from various places around the globe, we encourage you to learn the history of the land that you are on, on as we reflect on the past and acknowledge the changes that can be made going forward in the process of truth and reconciliation. So, as you all know, we are here to talk about this incredible novel, Molly Falls to Earth by Maria Much. I'm so excited to be here with you all this evening and introduce you very shortly to Maria Much and to Patty M. Hall. I first met, well, first I met Patty uh, a year ago when we launched her novel, Loving Large, with the Soapbox Press and the Authors Book Club um, to kind of provide a launch for her book as it came out right at the start of the COVID-19 pandemic. And I was just blown away by Patty, by her wit, by her absolute brilliance, by her kindness, by her generosity and her voice that comes through in her writing. Um, and it was just such, so incredible to work with her. And so in the fall, when she wanted to partner for another event that we hosted, she also introduced me to Maria. And we held an event, the three of us, that was talking about Patty's memoir, Loving Large. And so when I met Maria, she is equally brilliant to Patty, so kind, so thoughtful, an absolute genius, as you'll know if you've come into contact with her or read anything that she has written. Um, so it's just my absolute pleasure to be here with all of you this evening to talk about Maria's brand new novel, Molly Falls to Earth, and I can gush about it forever, but you're going to hear that as we go through this evening. So I'm just going to stop doing that for now. So just to give you a little idea of what you can expect for tonight. In a few short moments, you're going to be treated to a video presentation that Maria put together um, to give you a taste of the book through a reading that she did. She is a woman of many talents. She's also a photographer. So you're going to see her photography throughout the presentation as well. Afterwards, Maria and Patty will pop on and will join me as we dive into all aspects of the novel through the formal part of this evening as we go into our conversation. Afterwards, we will have a giveaway. We have two exciting, exciting prizes, so make sure you stick around for your chance to win. And after the giveaway, we'll have our kind of informal portion of the meeting, uh, the event, not the meeting, um, that will be interactive where you can ask any questions that you have to Maria and to Patty. Um, we'll invite you to come off, come on a video, turn on your mic so we can just all engage with each other and get to know everyone that's in the space. Throughout the event, please feel free to leave any questions that you have that you want us to address during the Q&A portion in the chat box. And also please use the chat box to engage with us um, also to engage with each other and um, take advantage of us all being in this space here together. And last but not least, before I give formal introductions to our two brilliant authors, please know that this event is live closed captioned. So all you have to do is press the closed captions button at the bottom of your screen. And so without further ado, I'm honored to announce, uh, my apologies, I'm a little nervous, to introduce Maria Much, the author of a memoir, Know the Night, and a short story collection, When We Were Birds. Her novel, Molly Falls to Earth, was released on April 27th by Simon & Schuster, Canada. 
Patty M. Hall is the author of the memoir Loving Large, a 2020 release, and as a book coach, collaborator, and ghostwriter, she is behind more than 20 nonfiction books. Patty's rare disease advocacy work has landed her work in Huffington Post, The Mighty.com, and Mama Load Magazine, and dozens of popular podcasts. And so now I will turn it over to Maria, who's going to share her presentation with us. Oh, it's brilliant. Begin there. Not with the sun, which is missing, and not this piece of sidewalk with its glinting bits of ice and salt. And not with the strange faces peering over her. But with the snow crystal two stories up. That small bit of electricity which shines. But people are looking down because of her. And they don't look up. Begin with Stella yelling, Mama, wear your hat. I wore a scarf and jacket because she complained yesterday that I don't dress warmly enough. I couldn't be bothered to change the sandals for boots. I was hurrying. No hat and my body then, through the apartment and out the door. The elevator with its tenuous grip, its nervous cables. You can find death in any moment or a piece of it. Something breaks or bursts or flattens. Natural locomotion meets disaster, but then disaster doesn't happen, and we forget. Through the lobby and down stone steps to this street, where the day was more than half over and the air cold and salt-flecked, I held ideas and messages in my head, too many apparently. I've wondered how the idea of a storm begins, what mind contains it. No doctor has ever agreed with my theory, however, that the beginnings of my seizures move along in winds and currents, the thought process of a wave. The idea takes time to reach me, but then it does. It finds me. Sometimes the possession is more subtle, a prolonged deja vu, more real than reality. Or sometimes it leaks out as a smacking of lips or a checking of pockets, as if I'm only going through the motions and I'm not really there. And then there's this, the sidewalk. I can say that I'm more fully here, more real than ever, but how would you know? I give you my heart, which races. I'll sweat. I'll urinate, or my bowels will let go. The things people fear most. Sometimes the world that opens up is an ecstatic one. 
another thing to fear. Wasn't that amazing? And I just learned right before we started this event, that was the first video that Maria has made. She's so talented. All right, can Maria and Patty come on? Hello. Hello. Oh, I feel Maria, like- the video is fantastic. Don't you feel like you've just had a trip to New York? Mm -hmm. Thank you. I wish I could. Thank you for your all your introductions, Tali. That was absolutely wonderful. Thank you for being here to both of you. And I'm just so excited to dive right in and talk all about Molly Falls to Earth. And so in that vein, I'm sure that there are at least a few of us here this evening that maybe haven't yet read the novel. So even though we just got a little taste of it, Maria, can you give us kind of like an elevator pitch of what Molly Foster <laughs> is all about? Well, I love that term, elevator pitch. Yeah, I, I'm not sure that anything I've ever written really qualifies <laughs> or does easily in an elevator pitch. Um, so the, well, the really fast version, I guess you could say, you know, woman falls down with a seizure on a wintry day in Manhattan and the seizure lasts seven minutes in which she experiences her past and memories, secrets, etc. cetera. Um, it's a little more complicated than that. I think maybe the longer version is um, a, a dance choreographer um, has epilepsy, which she tries to keep secret until, um, of course, she ends up having this tremendous tonic-clonic seizure um, on, on the corner of Washington Square Park. And it lasts for seven minutes, and that seven minutes is the container for the book. Everything happens within that seven minutes, and it's this kaleidoscope of experience for her, her past memories, um, traumas, secrets, mysteries, all of that. Um, plus, she's interacting with the people who are standing over her, and they are peripheral characters, but they're actually really important as well. Um, add to that, because one of the characters from her past has gone missing, um, a previous lover of hers. Um, there is a thread of missing people. There is a documentary that runs through the novel that is not so much um, about people who have gone missing per se, but rather focused on the people who are doing the searching. So that's it. That's the, that's the nutshell. Love it. Well done. I couldn't have done that in less than 20 minutes. So good. <laughs> no, yeah, that was incredible. The best synopsis that still leaves you wanting more, which is exactly right. what we want. Um, so, okay, we're going to continue with kind of the overview thread. Um, so whenever I read a book, I really love thinking about the title and the title Molly Falls to Earth grabs you right away. So I would love to learn kind of what is the story behind the title? Was it what you landed on immediately? Did you know that's what you were going to name the novel? Great question. Great question. That's a great question, Tali. Um, no. <laughs> no, no, I had, I ended up, um, 
so typically speaking, when I'm working on something, I, I have a working title. And I had a working title in this case that I really, really liked, but it wasn't, it was, it was really poetic. It, you know, it was, it was something that was sort of, it felt kind of magnetic for me and carried me through, but it wasn't exactly quite right. And so when I had finished, then I turned my attention to finding a title and I wrote pages and pages of different ideas and then put them up on a whiteboard in my office so that I could see the ones that I liked. And then I ran um, a bunch by my beloved editor, Lori Grassi, who I hopefully is here. She today. is here. She yes. is here. Yay, Lori. And um, you know what's happening right now, Maria? Everyone's asking for you to give the working title and I know how you keep your secrets. So I'm as anxious as they are. Are you gonna give it up? Tell us the working title. There are a lot of people I, asking. Actually, you know, I, I was gonna not because I was thinking, <laughs> well, it's kind of like, you know, you don't say, you know, the, the old name of a boat if we change the, the name of a boat. True. But I will say it because it actually appears in the book. So this is how I got around having to let it go, but still being able to use it. So the working title was, and I'm sure Lori will remember this, the erotics of departure. And we sort of felt that maybe it sounded a bit like a porn book. <laughs> and so maybe, it, maybe having erotics in the title was not the best idea. Um, and, and we both really liked um, Molly Falls to Earth and so did mm. um, other people on the team. So that's, that's how that um, went. But so it appears near the, um, getting close to the end of the book, Erotics of Departure is the name of a piece that Molly is working on. Right. Yeah. Right. You know, I'll jump in there because I, it, and I'll say more about your intentionality later, but the intentionality that Molly Falls to earth is it can't be underestimated. So I'll say more about this as we go on, but knowing Maria and her work as well as I do, I know that falls was of critical importance. And in fact, I wanted to talk a little bit about falling and what it really means and what it means in both intention as well as in absence, what it means when you're not falling. So one of Molly's dances, for example, Molly insists, I think she uses the word demands <laughs> that her dancers fall actually completely let themselves fall and of course as dancers that value their bodies who are always in control of their bodies they resist this and she insists that they actually fall that they she tells them their bodies will know what to do they won't get hurt and then there is one i think there's one dancer in particular maria who actually gives in relents relinquishes as is a word that comes up later on and she does the fall gets up hugs molly and realizes why molly wanted them to actually fall as opposed to controlled or poser posed so i'm thinking it was important that molly did fall as in didn't see it coming didn't know this was going to hit her today although she alludes to the fact that maybe she was thinking about too many things and that's why it happened but i wonder do you think we all need to fall more in order to experience life fully are we too controlled is what do you think about falling and what did you want us to think about falling when you use that in the name Oh, that's such a great question, Patty. Um, there, there are so many connotations to falling. There, there is the, you know, falling in love. There is the biblical fall, um, Adam and Eve. There is, um, of course, the, the seizures that, that Molly suffers from, where there is this total relinquishment and this complete, complete loss of control. But part of that also is about who is watching the falling and what the outsider mm -hmm. thinks is occurring, what they project onto that particular occurrence. Tie into that um, the history of, of New York City and uh, we have uh, an enormous tragedy that I actually use later on in the book, which is the Triangle Waste um, Factory Fire that probably a lot of, of you have heard of. Um, it happened in 1911. There is a building very close to Washington Square Park um, where uh, there were 
there was a factory, a garment factory on the eighth and ninth floors. Uh, there was a terrible fire and 146 people died, almost all of them women, very young women who were in this um, uh, sewing factory. And a lot of them jumped to their deaths. And then we have 9-11 um, and those images that, that came through because of that. Um, so there is this, so this was really on my mind, um, but in terms of Molly, there was, there was definitely the idea of, of letting go wrapped up in, in all of that. Mm -hmm. And Molly had no choice, right? So the choice to fall, the choice to relinquish control is also at play here. And, um, and I think that that's true and will come up later about the choice of how we interpret things and is, has a lot to do with our previous experiences. So anyone who I think now has witnessed 9-11 and thinks back to these women who I think were locked in, which is why they had to jump, yes. right? Yes. They were locked in, which right. is why they had to jump. So yeah. that idea of having no other choice but to fall. And in fact, even though they were jumping, I'm sure they had mostly weren't under any illusions of survival. So to me, there's that tie of the choice to fall, relinquish control and what will happen to us at the end. And this playing just at the edge of catastrophe is a reoccurring theme in the novel as well. Yeah, Molly is a very secretive guarded person. So she is um, exposed and made public when she has this, this seizure. And that that's a magnet for all the people who are walking by Washington Square Park and see this happen to her. And they rush to her aid and she is effectively vanished in some way. There is, there is the woman who they see having the seizure and then there is Molly having this tremendous experience. Mm, that's beautifully done. And what happens to her while she's there? Maybe Tali, you can probe that a little, little bit about, I asked Maria the question because I'm allowed to, I asked Maria the question when we are on our <clears throat> weekly in-depth calls where we sometimes explore life and sometimes explore our cat's noses. But um, I said to her, like, does the whole thing take place in Molly's mind? And Maria says, I'm not sure. So this I'd love for Tally for you to explore. I know it fascinates you about how Maria actually created the content of the book. Yeah. Oh my goodness. Okay. There's so much, so much. Okay. My brain is just racing from everything that the two of you said. And I'm like trying to hold on to all of the threads, but also trying to stay. <laughs> so Patty, thank you for guiding me. <sighs> um, well, okay, when I read Molly, I just think that you subvert genre in so many different ways because of the way that you, like the novel is written in fragments and vignettes and it reads like poetry, but also it reads like short stories, but it also tells one overarching story and we can already see the interweaving that you do in all elements of the book. Um, so the way I frame it is, let's talk about your novel as a hybrid and kind of how you how you weaved it all together and kind of what was your thought process and how did you connect all of the pieces? Well, um, so the, the original fragment of the, the essence of the story sort of emerged when I was putting together the story collection when we were birds. And that, that story collection has, it contains surreal stories and fairy tales, et cetera. And so I had been playing with this idea of, um, you know, what happens, what happens between this, um, you know, when we think something is happening to somebody and they come up with a completely different experience. And I was thinking about how we see reality, how we experience time. And um, it turns out that there are temporal lobe seizures that really play with perception and don't necessarily, in fact, knock the person down on the ground. Molly has two types of seizures. So one are the temporal lobe seizures, and those play with um, what she's seeing, what she's hearing, what she's feeling, how memory acts. Um, and she has also an experience of ecstasy. And of course, I thought that, you know, oh, th this experience of ecstasy that's 
you know, that is probably impossible. And so I'll write about it because that, you know, it hasn't happened. It's, it's sort of extra surreal. But of course, as soon as I started researching it, I discovered, obviously, I mean, nothing is ever new. And the experience of ecstasy during the, these types of seizures, while it's not super common, it does happen. Um, and in fact, uh, Dostoevsky had this exact kind of seizure. And he wrote about how awful his seizures were, how they um, took so long to recover from, except that he had this experience of ecstasy that was so amazing and so, um, so acute that he couldn't explain it to other people. So here's, here's Dostoevsky, you know, at a loss for words. Um, and he felt sorry for other people because they hadn't had this particular experience. And he said that it was worth years of his life. And I loved that. And I wanted to sort of start playing around with it and, and sort of imagine this into a woman who is very aware of her body and has had a really complex background. She was orphaned at the age of 12 and sent to New York to live with her grandfather. Um, and what happens when she develops this seizure disorder that she wants to hide? Um, and that everyone thinks is terrible. And of course she, she is made other because of this, of this condition. Um, but that opens up this whole other world of experience for her. The other thing that was, that was connected in here is that I had been reading about um, a, a famous French essayist who, and this is going back to like the, the 1700s, who had been having these, these like terrible episodes of, um, I think there were gallbladder attacks or something like that. And they were, they were absolutely incredible. He would lose consciousness. He was in terrible, terrible pain. And then during one of these episodes, um, in which he lost consciousness, he had this amazing experience. He was absolutely ecstatic. It was completely beautiful. And when he came to, his family all reported that he looked like he had been in the most excruciating pain they had ever seen. So what, oh. what he experienced and what they experienced were two um, utterly different things. Wow. Okay, before we talk about how well researched everything is just because so many different stories were just you know brought into everything you just shared i also want to go back to patty you mentioned yeah. maria's intentionality and also tying right. into kind of the hybrid elements of the novel for right. everyone that has read the book am i allowed to show a few pages just like of how of it course. Is on of the course book? Yeah, of course yeah but just so everybody gets an idea so great idea Right, so there's some pages that are written kind of like what you would expect, a standard novel, but then <laughs> what we would expect, right? She said standard, Maria. <laughs> I'm sorry, what a bad word, but then it kind no. of- No, right. And there it is, hold, hold that page, that's extra. So that is one of the paragraphs that I'll actually, I'll talk about the intention of repeating this paragraph that begins with seven minutes, that's all the seizure will take. And if, if you'll let me, Tally, I will talk a little bit more about not structure here, but format. So, mm -hmm. and because you're talking about this, you know, the myriad ways that we can subvert genre and Maria is an expert on multiple genres and has published in multiple, but in every single case format, and I mean truly the way the book is formatted is as significant to her as structure. You'll see the use of photographs, but not just the locate, not just the placement or insertion of photographs, but the photographs are actually used as part of the narrative because the location of the photograph is exactly tied in placement terms to what's being spoken about. I mean, this is this is in every way a credit to your editor and your publishing house in my mind, because you got yes. it to look the way you wanted. And it's just for those who are just scanning the novel uh, or are about to, nothing in here will feel typical to you for one key reason. We don't know if everything that's happening is occurring in Molly's mind or if it is occurring to the people whose names happen to occur at the top of an entry. So, and I've asked Maria about this, is that there are, and let me just give you a list of some of the elements of the book. 
highlights really there are nine beginnings there are parts of the book five i think the first one uh, each is marked with a number but the first one is called aura which i'm sure you want to speak about then there are all of these slices and the slices make me think of that electrical jolt that we know Molly thinks of when she has her seizure. She talks about, you know, how we are fireflies. She talks about the energy. She talks about the voltage in her brain. So I immediately got that feeling like we were being jolted with what Molly was still able to think about. And that gave me comfort that this was occurring all in Molly's mind, even though Maria was so eloquently weaving in her memories. I didn't know who they were happening to or whether we were in Molly's mind and I loved not knowing. Uh, but then there's, there's also that moment of the seven minute explanation, which you can speak to, which occurs, I think, in beginning number three and beginning number nine. There's the reminder to the reader that although this entire thing takes place in seven minutes and this exact paragraph, which alludes to the fabulous Glenn Gould, which is a favorite of Maria's and of mine, um, this is repeated exactly. And then it's followed by a reminder to the reader where I feel like this is where we hear Maria's voice saying, don't take this too seriously this is meant to be playful and then we never hear that again past the beginnings then other things the photographs are included they're placed in the book located exactly where maria may have wanted them the documentary as maria said punctuates throughout the novel as we revisit how other people are feeling about having lost someone uh, these glorious moments in the book where you have a neuron containing such and such, which reminds me we're inside her mind. And it was another way for you to bring us back to Molly on the ground, which you do so sparingly, and you leave it for us to decide whether this is happening to her or whether this is a story about her. So can you talk a little bit more about the importance of the visual appearance for the book, especially this book? I know it's always important to you because you're also a fine artist, but this book had that aspect of you wanted white space in certain places. You wanted fonts in certain places. You wanted bold in others. And that is the visual piece of your books for me is always just as fascinating. Um, the layout of Know the Night was like no other. And when we were birds, the same thing happens that the visual aspect of it, there were drawings, of course, placed in and weren't there photographs as well as when we were birds. So can you talk about how that is a unique aspect of your work, if that's not too, too close to the bone, but also how underdone you feel like that is in books today? Yeah, there. I mean, there's definitely, I think things are changing. The advent of, you know, so many fantastic graphic novels and memoirs, especially in the last few years, I think has, has changed some people's attitudes about image and prose, but it's still, I think, it, I think it's denigrated. I think, I think people relate it traditionally to, you know, children's books or whatever. And so there, there's kind of a I don't know, pejorative thing around it, and it, which is really unfortunate. So I, when I went to university, I have, um, uh, I, my degree is in visual art, which I think is the best education that a writer can have and, and maybe better than what is currently happening in, in MFA programs. And the reason is because visual artists are incredibly open in terms of what it is that they're they're doing and the tools that they're using. So there, there's no like um, nobody would say I, I'm only going to paint in acrylic and never do anything else. People are are doing sculpture, um, you know, photography, performance art, uh, installation work, putting putting everything together, etc. Artists are also incredible readers. So during university, I was reading a ton. And I came out wanting to be a writer, but I still had that really strong visual sense. So um, when when We Were Birds um, was being put together, I mean, I was gifted with um, one of the finest editors in Canada, who um, is Lori. And I know that she'll be blushing and saying, no, no, um, but, it's, but it's completely true. And when you have a great editor who really collaborates with you and will sort of um, feed those ideas and help bring everything together into a really dynamic package, it's magic. And um, she knew that I wanted to have some kind of visual element to Molly 
but I left it for the end. And I didn't make the final decision until close to, to the end. And I had, but I had, I took the pictures over that two year period thinking, you know, I think I'm, I think I'm going to want to do this, but I had this sense that, um, I didn't want to take pictures in Washington Square Park of the people, and I didn't want to take pictures of the arch. I wanted to keep it really mm -hmm. focused on the trees who are, are like creatures um, and echo that, that creatureiness that New York has, yes. because New York has so much personality, um, and, uh, and to keep it on the sidewalk and, and you know the bits of things that were on the sidewalk. I do have... Um, a story about taking pictures there. So I, yeah. I went in all different seasons to see how the park changed, etc. The book takes place, um, you know, she has the seizure in winter, but I went in spring, summer, fall, and to see what was happening in the park. It's a really lively. Um, it's a, it's an incredible place. It has um, so much going on in it, people doing Tai Chi and Qigong and buskers and musicians and people playing chess and skateboarders and people looking at the trees, etc. I had someone give me a tour of the all the, of the trees that are in the park. Um, and um, at any rate, there was one trip that I made in with my husband and it was the middle of summer. And I, I by this point, point, I think this was the very last trip that I made in to take pictures of the park. Mm -hmm. And I was really, really focused on the ground. And I was just looking at like, you know, cigarette butts and pieces of paper and pigeons. And mm -hmm. um, at some point I was, I was pretty satisfied that I had gotten all the pictures that, that I wanted to see. And um, so I was, I was done. And my husband Robin said to me, well, did you see the woman? And I said, what woman? And it turns out that there was this woman on a park bench right, right, like inches yeah. away from where I was taking pictures with her top off, breasts exposed to that urban sun and just enjoying this incredible day. And I totally missed it. I didn't, I didn't see her at all. She lives in my mind. Mm. <laughs> it's just the most magnificent mm. image and it's so New York and it is so Washington Square Park. Oh, you know, you know, I have to jump in here because former urban planner, former park designer, um, cities are my everything, my world, the hardscaping, but yeah, have, um, that, Patty. <clears throat> have a, the, um, let me say a couple of things about Maria's writing because I have the floor and the introverts <laughs> rarely get the floor, but <laughs> when fully appreciated the thing about Maria's work for me, although we've been close, close friends for years, the, to look at her work as a writer, author, podcaster, and all of the things that I am, it's that Maria's work alters the way we look at the world. And here's a perfect example. Of course, Maria would have missed the woman on the bench, but once she remarked on the woman on the bench, she memorized every detail of her because Maria has this almost binocular strength, acuity to looking at the world, which she keeps to herself until she writes. And it's that level of mastery is both what I love about her as a person and deeply appreciate and am mod a modicum of intimidated by occasionally in her work but Maria's view changes us and here's a great example in Molly Falls to Earth so I know that I see the world differently because Maria's work is in it and I see cities differently now and cities were my world before I wrote cities were in fact my entire profession and my passion um, Maria and I call the book Molly do so when I say Molly I mean the book um Molly will forever add a filter to my time in the city. This is something I've been writing as sort of a review that I'll post soon. It makes me more aware of the daily almost connections that I have with the little boy across the street from me who gets yanked down the sidewalk by his too big dog every day, but I don't know him and I don't know his dog's name. It reminds me about the young man across the street who always exchanges waves with me as I load my trunk and he's basking in the sun in his wheelchair on the porch. We're connected in the city, but our, our actions and theirs influence one another's in something like the butterfly effect, but also in like a domino effect, which Maria illustrates in one of her beginnings, how an event here dominoes to an event here to an event here. 
And that will forever change the way I look at how I operate in space. But the events of the seven minutes will outlast everybody's memory of that day. And you make this point in the novel and in through Molly's voice that they are, we interrupt one another's lives in the way that, you know, we're all going about our daily lives, but it's patterned interrupt us if somebody's life gets in the way of yours. And there's always a surprise. So the lion boy, the musketeer, and everyone else that's standing there will never forget the day they stood over a woman having a seizure in Washington Square Park. This will always be a memorable moment for them. So for me, what has changed is that I now look at my daily interaction since Molly came into the world for me. I was lucky enough to read it early on, but the way we lightly touch one another's lives, but in a choreographed sort of way, we touch as the woman, the pregnant woman passes through the crowd and lightly touches the arm of the little lion hearted boy, but we don't become part of one another's life. And in that way, we are acting on the city and the city is acting on us. And that will forever change the way I look at things. And you making the city a character allows us to have this interaction with it in space. And that was the most memorable part of all of Molly for me was that she saw everyone watching her, yet she couldn't connect to them. Some of them she thought she'd seen before. They knew each other in passing and yet they have this life-changing experience that only a city can can make for us. I think you say something in Molly's language about the city is constantly stirring up it's constantly, um, I won't have the exact one here, but it has this, this propensity or this tendency to constantly be shaking up our lives and that will change forever for me. I wonder what, how planned it was for you that Maria, that, that Molly interrupted these people's lives. And let's think about the woman that you talked about in the park. You can't forget her now. So how did those people become Molly's bystanders? I'm really interested in those people in particular. Are they taken from life? Are they people that you thought might be around Molly? Um, you know, it's just that, that intuitive process of writing, of waiting to see who or what shows up. Mm. Um, you know, we had been talking about, all right, so this idea of play and, and engaging with, um, when, when I think about, about play, I think about dealing with uncertainty and how so many of us live our lives with this incredible battle with uncertainty and what we don't know. And then we carry that into the writing process. And to me, this, this thing of not knowing is part of the fun it's part of the, it's an integral part of the process. And this is part of my relationship with this changed when I started watching jazz musicians play. Cause you know, and, and anyone who has read my, my first book knows that I used to take um, my older son who has Down syndrome and autism to hear jazz bands live because he absolutely loved them. And I learned so much about writing and about creative process while um, watching those jazz musicians. And there was this um, one uh, trumpeter in particular who was just really incredibly rooted when he would play and so dynamic and they would trade off ideas and musical riffs and they would quote each other as in repeat each other. And they're, they're not afraid of plagiarism, by the way. They, they, they quote each other with great um, deliberateness and then they, they riff on it. They take something and they turn it into something else completely. And they're very present when they do this. And there's this um, willingness to take what shows up in the moment and turn it into something and just use it. So there's a great story. If anybody has, has ever watched the, um, there's a Blue Note jazz documentary. And there's this, this musician who talks, um, tells a story about playing when he was a really young guy um, in a band with Miles Davis. So he, he's playing with all these people who are just so incredibly talented and uh, so far ahead of him. And they're all trading off solos. And then this guy, it's his turn. And he plays his solo and it's awful. He plays this, he ends on this really bad note. And when he does it, his heart just goes, oh my God. 
this, I'm doing this in front of Miles Davis. And it was Miles Davis's turn then to take what this guy had done and use it. Except that what had landed was just awful. Except Miles Davis took this huge breath and then he took that note and he utterly transformed it. Mm. He made it just incredible. And the guy who had made this so-called error understood then that he was being taught a really big lesson about take what shows up in the moment, regardless of what it is, don't judge it, just use it, make it your own. So all of that, when I was sitting down thinking about what is happening to Molly, um, you know, what is, what is it like to um, be in this situation? Who is coming to see her? Who is drawn towards her? And then just seeing, you know, what, what turns up. And all of it with, while Molly is able to be explain, and this might be just a question about seizures, which, uh, and, I, and we will step into your research about this, but Molly is, um, she's cognitive while she's in the seizure. So, or so the writing leads me to believe. She's, yeah. mem she's reminded, she's going back to her, the fire. She's going back to what she sees in the people around her. She's remembering an experience with Seth. She's dropping seeds of memories and experiences for Sabine, for, for Stella and Augustine. She's, um, you know, brings in her husband. She brings in Claire, you know, my least favorite character. There has to be, there has to be a villain, but <laughs> is that, is that, do you know that to be true? Did you research that to know that in a certain type of seizure, Molly could be remembering? I mean, do you have any way to, to validate that? Is that your hope? Is that what you wish? This is a this is a deeply fictionalized account of a seizure. Now, there for um, temporal lobe seizures, there there are um, people who do talk about what they experienced very vividly yeah. during the seizure. There, there was one guy who had one. He was his image was that he was he was actually sitting in um, a park in New York, but he had what appeared to him was somewhere else entirely. So he was, he had a total other reality, a complete wow. other existence while he was just sitting in the park in this other existence. And it's that, that which, what, what is reality? What is it composed of? Which one is the real one? Will the real reality stand up? And is Luna real? right I by the same know. token we yeah. don't know we don't this know. my friends this is the mastery of story <laughs> is that luna has luna one of the characters in the book is is critical to the plot critical to the advancement of these interior stories of molly's yet she's also magical she's also almost mythological she's the storyteller she's the crone she's the woman that knows everything she's she may not even be a woman we don't she is so captivating to me that she's the knowledge holder she's the keeper of history and perhaps the truth teller uh and no one listens to her because they mistake her for being something else and uh she's a she's a beautifully placed um character for our attention she's um i i i think without luna we'd be missing a great deal in the book and so she showed up, obviously, right? Luna showed up and you did something with her. Did you like Luna, Holly? Oh, my cat's name is Luna. So I have a yes. special soft spot oh, okay. um, for Luna's character. Um, but I did want to jump in. And this is me kind of taking a little side road in our conversation just to right. satisfy my own morbid curiosity. Maria, when you were writing, did you write everything in order in the way that it appears in the book? Or like, how did you, because you jump around so much between different moments and times and spaces and characters. So like, what was the writing process like? Mm. Really going with my curiosity and doing, so I was doing research and the way that I typically work is that I do a lot of research and I, I sort of, I, I make little riffs on things. I do diagrams. I write down paragraphs and, and sentences that, you know, have no proper grammar and 
things like that and I kind of sort things out and I look for what the seed of something interesting in it and I did I did a lot of research on dance choreography mm -hmm. um, uh, the history of New York and Washington Square Park in particular and uh, seizures, of course. Um, and the brain sure in particular. I thought, I thought the, the Cajal drawings were very moving. Yeah, and I know that they I, were very, they were very important for you. Yeah, and I went to, um, there was an exhibit of Cajal's uh, drawings of the brain um, at MIT that I went in to see. There, there are things like that. And then, um, and just building it out from there. So when I was doing my, my research on dance, on so Molly is a contemporary dance choreographer. So she, she is in the vein of Pina Bausch and Trisha Brown and uh, Merce Cunningham. And the thing about Merce Cunningham, I mean, he was, he was one of the most famous American choreographers for um, six or more decades. And he had, he was the, the person who, um, I think probably innovated the most in terms of he would create his decisions based on chance. So he used dice a lot. He would roll dice to figure out what is the next move a dancer was going to make. Um, he, and he also used the I Ching. So he would um, use these, these sort of methods of randomness to decide on exterior events. And I was really, really interested in that. And for a while, I thought that what I would do is create all of these vignettes and then number them and then sort of do this random, you know, and let, let chance organize things. But here's what happened. So using something like dice or, or giving numbers to everything and then putting it all in a hat and, and drawing out the numbers, etc. that that is, is great and it has this, you know, exploratory tone to it, but it's also, it's also constraining in a way. And by this point, I had been working with all of those little pieces for so long. And then these overarching stories of, you know, what was happening in her marriage, um, the, the guy who was missing, um, yeah. the, all the people who are searching for other people in the documentary, etc. cetera. Um, and I realized that there's just the, this intuitive thing that, that happens that was really overriding a desire to mm -hmm. apply randomness to it. Um, mm -hmm. And of course, um, my editor, Lori, weighed in with all her ideas of where things should go and how things should play out. So, and that's, that's part of the excitement and, and fun of working on something like that. It becomes a collaboration. Mm. And you and I have, have spoken about this, that if that um, things didn't have to occur in the book in a certain order, ostensibly, because as memories, and if, if the reader wants to assume that all of this takes place in Molly's mind during the seven minutes, and that these aren't, in fact, uh, experiences by the characters whose names come in, Raph, Seth, Sabine, then because they're memory, is the order in which she remembers them. They don't have to be linear in the timeline, which would be quite constraining. It would be more memoir-esque then really to go back and follow the, the through thread of a timeline. So, but you know, it demands an intelligent reader. It demands a really vivid imagination and it, it needed the level of um, visual, the visual aspect that you bring to your writing, because that let me remember her seeing that fire, Luna describing this fire. It didn't matter where things would be in time. And we were in fact going through Molly's entire life really back to her early childhood and, and her becoming an orphan. So time became less relevant and that got me into the space of during a seizure, it would be a big jumble. It would be a big jumble, but don't you wonder what would come to the forefront of your mind during your seizure? I mean, I, I found myself saying, what would, what would the trauma be? What would the moments of love be? What would those moments that I couldn't repress be? And I chose to believe as your reader that the most meaningful and perhaps most traumatic would be the things that would come up in that moment. I don't think you're going to you're, do your grocery list during your seizure, but that in fact is my fiction. That's a story I tell myself. You chose so selectively to merge love with 
loss to merge her painful memories with how much she adores her children. Um, and we needed, we needed you to do that so that we could be attached to Molly through the entire novel. We had to be part of that, that vivid set of memories of hers. There is a, a connectedness that I had been thinking about in terms of, you know, if you think about how our brains are wired and neurons branching, um, the branching of trees, the, um, the drawings that Cajal did, if, if anybody doesn't know who I'm talking about, you can, and you can just Google it, um, C-A-J-A-L. Um, he was one of the first um, scientists, he, he, he was an incredible artist as well. And he um, uh, looked at um, neurons on slides on you know, the early microscopes and did these exquisite drawings that are so beautiful that some people have cried when they've seen them. And those, those drawings and I, the ones that I saw at MIT, um, the, the branchingness is just absolutely incredible. And so this idea of everything being connected and going from one thing to another, and then these, the vignettes in the book actually having some connectedness. So they're, yes. so I think that was why I didn't want that random placement because I began to see, well, this is how the brain works. We think one thing and then we think another and another and they're all linked. It's, it's exactly how YouTube, works, it's algorithms, it notices what we think and then takes us on this um, incredible, you know, the YouTube rabbit hole that we've all been on where we start off looking at, you know, I don't know how to make porridge and end up with, you know, Russian dancers and, and, and you don't know how you got there, but it happened. And it's, and it's that linking of thought to thought to thought to thought to thought. And so there is there is a connectedness. Hmm. Connected, but not connection. And I go back right. to this with, um, and this is important, um, Tali, I, I, this is a bigger theme than I'm sure you wanted me to go into next, but this, that we can touch lightly on one another's lives. And that is connection. Um, even here in the suburbs, you know, I know sort of the give or take kind of the happenings of people's houses, but I don't know their names. I don't know who they are. I don't know anything about their intimate lives. I don't know what makes them tick, their happiness, their unhappiness. And you allow us to drop into the not knowingness of really deep emotions. So on connection is comfort to us, but on the other side of comfort are the experiences that provoke these emotional responses, everything from yearning to grief. We don't know one another's experiences of yearning and grief. And you play at that here with things like loss. Seth is lost, but she hasn't lost him. We use the word loss sometimes for death, but you also play at the idea of being out of sight, being lost. The little lion boy, lion, lion boy, has lost sight of his mother, but he's not panicking. She's not lost. She's somewhere else. She is an absence. But so there are all of these things, loss, absence, the vanishing. I loved the research that you did on the Japanese phenomenon of how many people have vanished. Choice is at play here. Then there's the going missing. You know, someone in the documentary says, oh, you can't miss him. He looks like this. You know, that's, some, that's something that gets said about me all the time. Oh, you know, you can't miss her. But think about the word play there, right? There's the being unseen. Are we missing if we're simply unseen? Do we vanish because we choose to go? We as introverts, if we extricate ourselves from social situations, are we lost? So I, I played at this idea of our attachment to one another and the way you use in Molly's language, connection because we connect all the time, but making connection is a deep inner choice. And what we feel when connection is broken, loss, absence, vanishing, runs the gamut, but none of those things are death. And I was so grateful that you had people, the idea of hiding in plain sight, but that's not death. And Molly was very blunt about this, that she had a hopefulness to it, didn't she? Where I think she says in her final pages where people say, you know, that in the city we'll step over a body on the street. And Molly says, no, we won't. No, we won't. It's more hopeful than that. Even though connection um, 
contact seems to be impersonal. We exist in this connectivity, as you said, one thought to another, one person to another, one life to another, that is far more hopeful than the way we talk about urban life. I think this is something we're all going to reflect on after COVID, this loss of connection that maybe isn't a loss of connection at all. What it is, is a change in how we connect. I mean, there are 35 of us right now in my office you know, that is a point of connection that I couldn't have had or maybe wouldn't have had before. Yeah. And me, to me right now, we are, your novel is seven minutes in the life of a city reminding us that we're all connected and the same way that we're sitting here for an hour talking about the connectivity and a shared experience of the book. And I am so grateful that Molly reminds us in a hopeful way that loss can be looked at in myriad different ways. It does not have to be experienced as the ultimate grief. That's where the, the thread of missing people comes in. And why is it that as a culture, we're so fascinated by people who have gone missing? And, and I'm certainly one. Um, I, I, did, I did the, you know, the, the rabbit hole of missing people documentaries and was just fascinated by the stories of of people who were doing the searching and what happens to them, what they project onto um, the, the people who have gone missing, how they stay oftentimes in a sort of a static position as the years go by and they retain this sort of position of hope that the person yes. is still alive. And it was in watching those documentaries, they were so interesting to me that I realized that I wanted to have some of those people inhabit the book. Um, mm. And that's, that's exactly what happened. The, a symbol of me that will stay with me for a long time is that glorious twist that one second you give us of Sabine doesn't want to use Seth's, Seth's underground parking spot because if she fills it his he won't come home his space will be taken up and I posited yeah. to you when we reflected on the book that I wonder if that's what love is that that space that is held as if each of us in the world has a little space held for us because other people care about us and the space never disappears because someone in every way um, hold space in their heart for us and in their lives for us. And his parking spot is Sabine's ultimate um, survivor's hope, not survivor's yeah. grief, right? Yes, exactly. Well said, Patty. Oh my goodness. Okay. I'm just looking at the clock and I noticed that it is 8.05 p.m. And so I'm thinking that we're not going to end anything. We still have plenty of time, but I wonder if we want to have a brief intermission with our giveaways and then we can start to open up the floor to our audience and hear what questions Great. we have. And we- yeah. Are we I, doing the wheel? We're going to do the wheel. Okay, everyone, prepare yourselves. Okay, but we haven't talked about what the, what the prize is. Yeah, Maria, why don't you tell us what the prize is? Okay, so two lucky people, Bob, will be getting the risk takers writing package. So um, of course, it'll have a Molly copy in it. Um, but both people will get Han Kang's The White Book. This is, um, this is one of my absolute favorite books. Uh, Han Kang is a Korean writer. She's absolutely tremendous. And this book, by the way, if you are interested in, in books that, that do have images, um, uh, she uses she uses images and white space um and the other book is olga takarchuk's um uh primeval and other times so takarchuk won the nobel prize i want to say in 2018 i might be wrong she is the one who wrote flights which won the booker a couple of years ago as well um, this book is really, really extraordinary and very lush and a bit sort of folk tale -ish. Um, so, um, so two people will be receiving those three books. So exciting. Okay. 
<laughs> it is exciting. It is very exciting. Good books that are handpicked by Maria. What a gift. <laughs> so can everybody see the wheel? Oh. So the way that this is going to work is we are going to spin the wheel and then whoever it lands on, it's going to get the prize. And if they are not here, we're going to spin it again. And if Robin, if Robin wins, I get the prize. Yeah. <laughs> Clapping? Yeah. Oh, Tully, this is fantastic. So Adriana is our first winner. Oh, and there's Adriana. Oh, Tally, Tally, hold on. I have to say, I won enough prizes. I won so many prizes at your events. I don't know how this always happens. Can you <laughs> I think the wheel chose you. I had no idea. Yes, it's it's very, very strange. Like, it's can fake. you do it again? No? Well, no. Fake. I mean, nothing was fake. The names are entered. Okay. It's a real <laughs> wheel. Nothing is fake. No, no, oh, no, there it is fate. It is fate. Oh, fate, I heard fate. <laughs> like it's not fake. <laughs> Thank you, okay. Yay, Adriana. Congratulations, Adriana. Thanks. And now we will spin again. Maria, I feel like you should have been the one spinning. So next event, you're gonna spin the wheel. <laughs> oh, I just think this is so fun. Catherine! Yay, Catherine! Yay! <laughs> Yay, Catherine, are you still here? Yes? Yes. Yeah, Catherine is there. Yay, Catherine. That's amazing. Congratulations to our two winners. Please feel free to send your addresses to or mailing addresses to contact at the soapboxrights.com and we will coordinate getting your prize to you. Congratulations. Yay, that's fantastic. Mm. That was okay. <laughs> so is it um, Q&A time? It is Q&A time. So how this will work is we invite you, if you're comfortable, to come on video, say hello, introduce yourselves, um, and let's chat. I can't wait. Who's up? Hi there, Christy. This is a synchronicity thing. I picked your book up kind of at random at the library because I was intrigued by the flyleaf copy, even though I shouldn't be because I write flyleaf copy. Started reading it yesterday and put it down because I did not want to have a book hangover today. Googled and found this. And I'm just firmly convinced we're all connected at the roots by the trees. Oh. And I have really enjoyed all three of you so much and I've taken a lot of notes and I'm going to mute myself now because I have a tendency to talk too much when I'm nervous. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much, Christy. That's awesome. Wonderful. Oh. Strikes again. Yes. That's, like, that's beautiful. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that. That's amazing. And she writes flyleaf copy that I always, I feel like that about poets. It's like, I just do yeah. this homage to the people that write yeah, flyleaf exactly, copy. Exactly. And I do this, it's like, <laughs> oh, um, yes. yes. Oh yes, absolutely. You know, I love what you said, synchronicity and trees. This is something Maria and I spend a lot of time on and may, maybe Maria, we can get you to tell if there's a minute and we don't have, um, and no one's jumping in for a second. Maria did a tour of Washington Square Park with, I call her the tree lady. Yeah. And Maria, can you tell the story about, first of all, the glorious species, the one significantly older tree, some of the history that you learned, because this was so fun for me over these years of you writing this book where I got to relearn and learn so much new New York history, but your interest in the trees was not botany so much as connectivity and other things. So I'd love to have you when, you know, as the questions roll through, I'd love to have you describe what it was like to ask questions of the tree lady, the tree yeah. expert. Yeah, um, Georgia, she was absolutely incredible. She was, um, she's a botanist and she does tours of uh, Washington Square Park to tell people about the tree. She does a lot of advocacy work. Um, she's, she's really extraordinary. But there was, she took me over to one tree in the park. It's the oldest one, it's, it's 300 years old. It's a, a big English, um, Elm. And the, the thing about 
in New York is, and this is what I didn't understand about New York until I started really get delving into my research, is how many times big parts of it have burned down. So that's why New York seems so young, um, because even though it is uh, 400 years old. So she took me over to this tree, which has, has managed to be there for 300 years, and it's, it's the, known as the hangman's tree. So the belief is that it was used to, um, to hang prisoners, um, though nobody knows that for sure. But the other interesting thing about Washington Square Park is what lies underneath it, and that is um, 20,000 bodies are buried there. So this is um, uh, Native people were placed there, slaves, um, various immigrants and other um, poor people and there was a cholera epidemic that came through and the people who died were also placed in Washington Square Park before it was the park, obviously. Um, and it was just it was just a big potter's field. And so when Molly is lying there having her seizure, she has this this awareness of the the 20,000 people who are buried uh, right directly underneath the park. Mm. There was also a river, a small river, a brook, the Mineta, that used to run um, by Washington Square Park as well, and that was buried. Hmm. I think somebody- We've, we've got a, a question. Any, yeah. anyone, anyone can bring their cameras on now if they want yeah, to. I can, I can only see a few people. So Tali, I yeah. think you're gonna have to help me pick out people. I think it's Fabiana, hi. Yeah. Hi, hi, Maria. I just wanted to say hello and, and how you know thankful I am from this this um, wonderful meeting. Um, you know when you were talking about the idea of uh, Molly falling and how hard she uh, fell, uh, we were talking about connections and how people are connected. For me, also uh, the connection of words is very important because I'm a word lover, like like all of us. And it came to me the idea that this root, the root of the word molly, is um, related to some word in Latin that is mollis, that means soft. And there is a crazy word in English, uh, molescent, I think it is, that means something like like that is softening and related to the idea of something soft. Um, so I thought, well, yeah, Molly can fall, but not that hard. And, and you know, I, I imagine this may be something absolutely unconscious for you, but I think you chose the right name for someone who is falling so deep. So mm -hmm. that was my <laughs> little oh, thing. Thank you, Fabiana. <laughs> Um, you know what, so the thing about the, the name Molly is a favorite of mine, and it is very, very soft, and she is not a soft woman. She is quite prickly. Um, one of my sisters said, you know, she's kind of a dick, <laughs> and in a, in, you know, she meant it in a nice way, um, in a liberating way, and which is very true. So Molly is, um, she, she is who she is. She is a fearless creator, um, and she is stuck with this really soft, lovely name that kind of suggests something other than than who she is and she's she's wildly strong um but you're right she mm -hmm. has she falls and she has a soft landing that's really beautiful thank you, mm -hmm. thank oh, you. And, and we just got a question in the chat from christy lamont ellis she says maria have you read lincoln in the bardo because i felt the commonalities in my very bones um no, um, and I don't know why, because I have it here somewhere, um, but no. And maybe maybe I didn't read it because of not wanting to be, um, you know, influenced in, in some way, but of course now I'm free and clear and I can read it. So thank you for bringing that up. Okay, well, so then also I would ask if you've read The Enchanted by Renee Denfeld. No. No, is that another one that I should pick up? I believe so. There the are enchanted. I don't I don't give my fives lightly on Goodreads. And I haven't like I said, I haven't even finished yours and you're already a five. Like in the Bardo was a five, the enchanted was a five. And again, it's back to this interconnectedness. Yes. Wonderful. Thank you. Yeah. So but I, I recommend. Uh, Renee has written several different things, but to me, The Enchanted is 
just I, I wanted to, after I read it to run out in the street and just shove it at people. Oh, that is, is what I want to do. I, your I'm putting that on my list. Thank you so much. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And the bardo does mm -hmm. kind of appear briefly in in my book. There there is so there is that you know or where what existence exactly is this? Um, so there was a. So I have another story. So there was um, years years back, I was listening to um, Larry King and I, I don't know why, I, I don't typically, I never typically followed him or whatever, but one night he was on TV, I watched and he was talking with a, a famous medium and they got really, really serious and he sort of leaned into her and said, do you think that there is a hell? And she said, Oh, we're in it. <laughs> and it was just like, that was the best thing I think I had ever heard. So um, I think that the concept of hell is really our thoughts. So this place for some of us is hellish. It's a hell realm. And for other people, it is, um, is heavenly. And then for, I think most of us, it's somewhere in between. Mm, beautifully said, Maria. That's so funny that you just mentioned hell because I'm reading Dante's <laughs> Divine oh, Comedy right are you? now. <laughs> um, but before I get to my question, I just want to say thank you so much, Maria, for bringing this um, piece of art into the world because as a writer myself, I know one of the things that has always held me back is... Um, especially with, and Patty knows this struggle well, um, a, a novel that I've been working on, it's, I've always struggled with the structure and, and like the things that I'm drawn to write, I'm like, no, no, it's not. And I just realized recently that I've been trying so hard to make it like a traditional, yep. <laughs> normal yep. book. Right. And I, I almost feel like your book has sort of given me that permission to just go with whatever I feel like writing and just Thank let you. it be what it needs, mm. needs to be. So thank you for that. Um, and I have a couple of questions, although I'm tossed it's between the like the writer question and the question that maybe other people might be interested in as well. So I'll go with the, the non writer specific question. I wanted to know, when did you first imagine Molly? Like, what was it about this book? Like the first idea you had, if you remember, like, was it a line of dialogue that popped into your head? Was it something visual you saw and it suddenly gave you like, that spark of inspiration to write this. Um, was there anything particular that? That's decided? that's going so far back because, as as I said, the or, original idea emerged when I was working on the book of short stories. So we're going back about six years. Um, so and it's I know that that the the initial the that initial idea was that collision of dancer desire because she has she has this really she had this really frenetic um romantic relationship although in the, that original short story there was no he hadn't disappeared or anything like that it was just that the nature of how some relationships that are egoic love are really hate-filled that there is this yes. um incredible magnetism that certain relationships have for us that can be in you know even if the relationship is very negative um and that was really interesting to me and then and this idea that she had seizures and and kept them as a secret so she had this this really volatile electric secret thank you so th thank you so much i'm so glad that you're you're feeling like you know this has given you some Mm -hmm. uh, I know I almost wish I hadn't read it because because you had just mentioned not reading the other book because you didn't want to be influenced and I'm like oh god I hope I'm not going to go and talk <laughs> <you>. <laughs> oh, no, really, thank you <laughs> thank you very much thank you I see some bubbling questions does anyone else want to jump in yeah oh hi Melanie Melanie un just unmute your mic Melanie hear you you're, you're still muted Melanie yeah you just have to unmute it perfect okay can you hear me yes yes, yes. 
Hi, Melanie. Uh, part of the question uh, the previous speaker asked, which was, when did you have the inspiration for the book? And what was the time frame between your inspiration and your execution to actually begin writing it? Hmm. Um, so yeah, so I think I think I'm going back about six years for the very beginning. Um, but then I was I was working on the book of short stories, so I, I had to put the Molly idea away because I I could feel that it was just getting bigger and wanted to be something. Um, bigger and, and longer and more complex. And so I just, I removed it from the collection and just let it sit. And then I finished the collection and then, then I was free to start working on, on the, the novel. Did, did I answer? Yes, you did. I'm just wondering if there are any uh, writers who actually tackle two books at the same time. Oh, I think that there, I think that there, there are, all kinds of writers mm -hmm. who, you know, have different projects going and then they see which one sort of asks for the most attention. Right. Yeah, I, I yeah. think I think that's relatively common. Yeah. That's a great question. Mm -hmm. It's it's both common and sometimes by necessity. I I'm a I'm a co-author, collaborator, ghostwriter, so I quite often have multiple projects at different phases. And as Maria said, you know, the one that begs the most attention often rises to the forefront. But sometimes it's just uh, it just has to be that way. And and I quite often want external elements to decide for me which book has to come first because I find myself in love with all of the projects similarly. So external factors invade the writer's life. Jennifer Egan talks about, um, there was one book of hers and I don't remember which one it was. Maybe it was A Visit from the Goon Squad and she had, she wanted to write it. It had been sort of simmering for years and years and years and she would keep going off and writing a different book. Um, and it, it sort of had to do with courage. It was, you know, she didn't quite have the, um, it just wasn't quite there for her yet. And so she would keep, you know, just veering off with another book and then come back and start writing it and then veer off for another one until finally it stuck. So I think, I think that can happen more often than you might think. Yeah. One of them wins out. What's that? One of them wins out. Yes, exactly. Exactly. Thank you for that. Thank you. So many great questions. Do we have any others? I have a really quick question. Hi, Marjan. Hello, Maria. Congratulations. <laughs> Thank you. Um, nice thanks to meet you Marjan. virtually, Marjan. Yes, <laughs> nice to meet you. This was an amazing um, conversation. Thank you, all of you. I, I've been busy taking notes. And I love, love this book so much. One quick question I had, Maria, is I know you and I have talked about this, but I, I seem to always be begging to know more. You mentioned about uncertainty and how it's part of the fun. And I get that it is, but there are times when it can feel like not so much fun. So do you have, um, and I know we're short on time, but do you have something you maybe remind yourself of when you're hitting that period of uncertainty just to help you go through? Yeah, just that I've been there a million times before. So you know, as you know me very well, that I meditate and I, in particular, do Buddhist meditation or also known as Vipassana, also known as mindfulness meditation. And that is um, so deeply connected to being able to sit with uncertainty. So it's not, it's not the idea of pushing uncertainty away um, or, you know, sort of trying to cover it over or neglect it. It's, it's really going full on into what we don't know and embracing that state so that the term is don't know mind. And, um, and, I, and I thought to you know, and you, you and I have talked about runners, you know, long distance run, runners, because your, your husband does ultra running. Um, and when I think about people who are running those incredibly long races, you know, 50 miles, 100 miles, and, um, and it's, they're so interesting. And I've read a number of accounts of people who do that. And they're, they always, always mention some part during the middle 
where they hit rock bottom. They um, felt, why am I even doing this? This is so ridiculous. It's really painful. They think all of the thoughts that writers tend to think during the long haul and they just keep going. And that's, I mean, that's exactly the mechanism that writers are doing in order to get to the end of the book. It's really uncomfortable at times. And as you well know, and you just, it just is. And then, and then you wake up a different day and it's okay. <laughs> mm. Excellent, thank you. Thank, thank you, you. Marjan. <laughs> I had I had one thing I wanted to say, Marie. Hi, Lynn. Hi. How are you? I am just so delighted for you, and I just want to say, having read Know the Night when I didn't know you at all, and oh. then having read your collection and now Molly, I just want to tell you that this was a beautiful night, and I just want you to keep creating. Oh, yes. Um, Thank you're, you. You're Lynn. a very very special voice, and. It's just, it's just a delight to read whatever you write. So congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. Well, for, for everybody here, um, Lynn Griffin is not only a great writer, but she is also a coach who, or an instructor at Grub Street. I met, how many years ago is it? Um, is it seven? No, but when did we meet? Because that was 2012, right? Yeah. Yeah. So I was I was in Lynn Lynn and Katrin um, were the leaders of this group. There were fourteen of us, and a bunch are here tonight. Yay, launch blabbers! We all had books coming out, and you you and Katrin put us through the paces of putting a book out, etc., and doing media. And there were so many things that you said that stuck. And one of the things that you said, and I. I think about this all the time is that you had talked about if you have a bad day or you know there's a bad review or just something terrible happens um, you just put your head down and get back to work and I think about that all the time and thank you for saying it and you you and Katrin were just wonderful teachers so thank you thank you well thank you I I I loved every minute of that teaching experience and I really still believe that is true, that the outside world is going to weigh in and people yes. who love your work will find you. Uh, but when people are unkind or when people don't get the work, you just need to keep working. <laughs> so I'm glad that resonated. Yeah, it sure did. Thank you, Lynn. <laughs> You're welcome. Well, I would, I would say that sometimes when you don't care for somebody's work and you give an honest review that it's, you know, I don't care for it, but this is why I don't care for it. But yeah, they wrote a book that that helps other people understand it and decide whether they want to read it. Yep. And I come at that because uh, a late ex-boyfriend wrote a book and I rated him a two and said, this is not my cup of tea. And he said, I'd rather have an honest two than a fake five because it tells people what to read. <laughs> and, and, and I make no bones every time, not every time, but most of the time I do something I'm like, you know, and good for them. They write a book, I just sit by the pool and whine about what I don't like, right? <laughs> but I do think an honest two is better than a fake five on Goodreads. And I think, uh, I edited a, a young adult fiction manuscript recently and I was like you're you're just gonna have to get ready that people aren't go some people aren't gonna like this you know are you ready to put your baby out there to get it smacked around mm -hmm. because people are gonna say what they say um <laughs> well, well said <laughs> no, smacked around. Again, I'm, I'm talking too much because I'm nervous no, all. no, that's fantastic. I'm like, and I'm, I'm like stalking everybody. I'm following you all on Instagram and Twitter and Goodreads and everything. And you're like, who's oh. this woman? Is she going to suddenly show up in my den? Like, sprung like a cat? No, I'm not. I promise. <laughs> that's great. Thank right you. here. Just talking too much. Thank you, Christy. So, so I'm, 
have to be the watchful person on the time. And I really don't totally. like that person. I know mm. I'll, I'm the bad guy, but it's okay. Um, but I just want to say that this was so phenomenal. And I feel like my batteries have been recharged to 200%. So thank you so much, mm. Maria and Patty, for being not just lovely human beings, but enormously talented and brilliant creators. So thank you for sharing with us tonight and for taking part in this conversation. Maria, extra special, huge, humongous thank you to you for sharing Molly Falls to Earth, yes. us, making sure that it was fruit for getting it out in the world. So thank you. It is a true gift that I think all of us are very grateful for. Make sure if you have not yet got in your copy or borrowed it from the library that you do so and you read it. And then when this um, event is back on YouTube, you can re-listen and re-watch and then have a whole new perspective on everything. That's right. You then you'll know what we're all talking about. Yes. <laughs> um, and also make sure that you check out Loving Large if you haven't read it as well by Patty. Thank so you. two phenomenal books to add to your list. I also have to add a shameless plug for the Soapbox Press. If you liked our event here tonight, then we do lots of events throughout the course of the year. Um, so be sure to visit our website, www.thesoapboxpress.com um, to keep in touch with all of the books that we publish and also check out what events we have going on. We do have one coming up next Friday, June 4th. We have a virtual gala celebrating five years of the Soapbox Press. So if you want to celebrate with us, then I would love to see you there. And with that, I'll give the final word to Maria. Thank you so much, Tali. Thank you for putting this together and for your incredible efforts. And you are just an absolute delight to talk to. And I and just so love this so much. You are an incredibly talented person. And Miss Patty, thank you so much as ever for Always. being here with me for this great chat. Um, your, your words and your support just mean everything. Um, I'm wondering if, if people wouldn't mind turning on their, their cameras so that I could see the we'll wonderful people. Now.